Hello, in this video, we will take a look at how functions work. So the, we will talk about built-in functions and user-defined functions, the differences between functions and views, how functions can be used for reporting, and also how functions can be used for ETL processing. We've got a lot to do, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'll just create a simple database for the demo and add some views to it. Not much new happening in this code, uh, except that I am using a built-in function. This uh, function is the database ID function, which when ran, if it finds the database, it will give you a identifier, an ID number for it. Uh, if it doesn't, it'll come back with a null, so I ask the question, if you found something, if it's not null, um, that means it must exist. And in that case, I'll go ahead and, and drop the database. Otherwise, create it. In fact, not otherwise. Uh, whether you drop the database or not, always create it. And if there's any error messages, please print them out. Other than that, the other part of the code just creates a couple of views using the Northwind database. And I just did this because I want to play with views a little bit more since we have focused on views in the previous videos. Next, let's take a look at some built-in functions. Um, some of these we've used, certainly get date we've used. Uh, get date, of course, shows me the current date and time. They should probably call it get date and time, but they didn't. Uh, date part is one that uh, I don't remember if we've used or not, but it's pretty handy. It extracts out various different parts of a date. So you can put in month, you can put in year, you can put in day. And if you ever want help on a particular function, you can highlight the function and hit F1. Now I have seen it where sometimes this doesn't work well. Uh, I'm not sure what's up with that. It used to work, you know, pretty much all the time, but um, it is an issue. If it doesn't work, um, you may have to open it up a browser first navigate to Microsoft's help documents, and then try the F1 uh, button. Often that takes care of the issue. But from here, you can see the different settings, so quarters and months, uh, day of the year is handy, um, week, weekday is handy, and then uh, we have minutes and seconds and milliseconds and even nanoseconds. So lots of, lots of options for us to, to work with and a little breakdown of this. You notice that you can also use the word week or weekday, and that's the thing with functions. Often, they're very flexible about what you can pass in. Now, this function, and like so many others, returns a single value when you run it. But, of course, if you apply it to many different values, you'll get many different answers. Uh, and it's easy to do if you add a from clause to your select, it will apply the function to each and every row of data. So in this case, I'm extracting out the year of the current year, and I'm extracting out the year of uh, the previous year when the uh, order was placed. I can see here that customer, customer LAFKI had indeed ordered something in 1997 and 1998, which um, of course is quite a while ago. There are actually lots of functions that you can use. Uh, some I used on a regular basis are these, aggregate functions. Uh, some max, minimum, average, and count. Very, very simple to use. And they do exactly what they you would expect them to, use, to do. So they give you the maximum value, the minimum value, the average value, um, the count of rows under this particular order. So I can see that uh, product number 23 has been ordered 20 times. Uh, the average... Uh, in this case, quantity was 29, but we had a maximum of 70 and a low of two. Uh, the grand total, if, if you take into all the uh, times it's been ordered, 23 has been ordered, um, um, a number of, excuse me, 580 product 23s have been ordered. Now, if I want to see the name, I just do a join, but uh, we're here for functions. Speaking of functions, uh, another function that um, you'll use is cast, and a third is, uh, a second, I guess I should say, is convert. Cast and convert are very, very similar to each other. With cast, 
Uh, it's an older way of doing it. You can cast a string into an integer, or maybe a string into a decimal, or maybe a decimal, excuse me, a, a integer into a character data. Uh, those are all possible with cast. This uh, conversion has converted the string into an integer value, the string into a decimal value, up to four possible um, numbers with two after the decimal point. Let's uh, let's play with this for a minute. I'm going to bring it down to two and run it again. Get an error message there. That's because I need at least three numbers to hold the data. But if it's larger, it'll accept that as well. The, um, the third one here converts to character data. So I take a number and convert it to character data. That's quite handy if ever I want to concatenate on something as um, a string of, of text. Oops, it's got to be on the outside of that. Let me take, take care of that. There we go. So, because otherwise, if it's just a number, it's not going to be happy with me when I try to add them together. So, cast is actually really quite useful. Um, you use it in a variety of ways, certainly. But it all does the same thing. It converts data from one type to the other. Now, um, speaking of conversion, there is a convert function. It is newer. It's similar, but there are a few differences. Uh, first difference is that with cast, you say cast this string of characters into an integer. A string of characters happens to be a number. But with this, you say convert, you say um, take the, um, the value and you put the data type you want to cast convert it into first. So you put the data type first, not second. You don't use the as keyword either. You use a comma. So decimal comma, the value in varcar 50, comma, the value I want to convert. Other than that, they're very similar, but certainly the syntax is different. Um, there is a couple other things that are, are different. The conversion function, or convert function, has additional options. The, um, the other options that uh, appear when you want to do additional formatting. So let me bring that up. Uh, this time it failed. I'm not sure why, but when, especially since previously it worked just fine. There we go. I uh, went ahead and, and pressed it a second time and it worked. So here we are, um, the conversion and cast are both on the same page on Microsoft's page, uh, but uh, the difference is, and you know what, I prefer the dark, but I'm going to change over light because I think it's easier to see in a video. The, um, the difference is these conversion features. So here I have uh, a date and time style that I can apply, or when I'm converting to floating points and real values, I have some settings there, or from money to small money styles, or some XML stuff or binary stuff. Anyway, there's... Um, Features that you get and convert, you don't get in, in cast. And the ones I use most often is the date formatting stuff. So, for example, let's take the current date. I'll cast it as a date. Or take the current date, um, convert it as a date. Or let's convert it to character data, but apply a style to it. And there's, a, there's several different styles, but um, here's the three I use most often. The style with slashes, that's 101. The style with dashes, that's 110. And the style where you put the year, the month, and the date in that order as a just a, um, a straight number. I think that actually works in a variety of places. I certainly use it all the time. Um, some other date time functions that I think you'll find useful is um, isDate, which validates whether or not uh, what it's seeing is a date. Uh, date difference, which you can tell it um, what frame uh, frame of reference you want to work with, but you can actually get the difference between a date and another date. Uh, date name, in which case you can actually extract out the uh, nice uh, 
textual name, so month or in this case weekday, or date part, in which case you actually, if I hover over it, I'll see I'll get a, a integer value. It says returns an integer. The um, this will give me the month. So right currently, right now, it's August. So it'll be eight uh, weekday. Um, will also give me the weekday. Let me run it and I'll show you what it what it does. So here we see the uh, is date comes out as true. That's a one date difference between the original order date and the orders table. And now is twenty one years. Um, the date name shows July. Date name using the weekday option is Thursday. Um, at least it was for the day that was ordered. And then um, we see uh, the use of weekday here instead of weekday. Let's see. Day week. Yeah. Just different options that you can use. They both do the same thing. I kind of prefer typing it all out, but then sometimes I get lazy and just use the abbreviation. Um, we can see here the uh, date part gives a numeric value. So this is date part. Um, when I ask for the weekday, it gives me five or two in this case of Monday. And that's because Sunday is where they're starting at with one. And of course, um, I could actually go ahead and extract out the individual pieces like the day, the month, the year using these specific functions. They'll um, give me integer values. So since I want to concatenate it, I'll convert it over to character data using cast. I think varchar 50 is overkill, but it doesn't really matter much. Um, and then I can go ahead and put whatever separator I want. Like in this case, I just used a pipe symbol to include a separator, but this means I can get a custom format using that. Anyway, those functions are quite handy. I use them all the time. I think you'll get a lot of use out of them too. Some other ones that are handy uh, that are something I use is the immediate if, in which case you ask a question and then if the answer is true, you can evaluate as one value. If it's false, another value. So it doesn't have to be numeric values. Uh, often one and zero are used for true and false respectively, uh, but with the immediate if, I can actually evaluate to anything, including character data. So for example, let's say I apply it to the product and ask the question, is it true we're looking at product number three, product ID three? And if that is true, then we will just apply a additional bit of text that says not for sale. If it's not true, I just go ahead and apply the, put in the name. So if this evaluates a true, do this. If it evaluates a false, do this. And by doing that, it's not really performing an action. It's just performing a evaluation and displaying the outcome. Another one similar is choose and that it displays an outcome. Uh, the big difference is though that with the immediate if you only have two options, the true option and the false option. Uh, with choose, I can actually have many options. I'm sure there's a limit, but I don't uh, it's not a practical one. So uh, in this case, the uh, you set up a list of options. And then one thing that is interesting is it has to be a, uh, a numeric, um, they call it an index value, an integer. So it's basically a collection or a list of values. And then this would be index one, index two, index three, and so on. Uh, to show you, if I'll go ahead and run this code, because I have selected index one, I get the first value, A. Uh, on the second option here, choose, I selected index three, so I got the third option, C. And of course, if I apply that to data in a table, I would see the, uh, when it came out as category one, it'd be A, category two would be B, category three would be C, but anything that didn't match um, my options of A, B, or C. In other words, one, two, or three, they just come as null. So, uh, an interesting option. If I, there is a function called isNull that I also use on a regular basis. And with that, 
whenever you get a null, you can just replace it with something else, whatever that something is. And cool thing about functions that you can kind of mix and match and, and build your own output. Along the same lines is the case operator. The, um, it's actually not considered a function, but certainly acts similar to the functions we just looked at. The way it works is you evaluate an expression. Once you get the answer, you can compare it to an answer. If it's 10, then do something, print out some display. When it's nine, print out, print out a different display. So if I put in five plus five and run this, and if I evaluate to 10, and I get the word 10, or whatever else a word I put in there. Very, very handy. If I, um, before the end statement, if I go ahead and put an else in here, it will put in whatever, again, I want. Let's see, else, got to spell the full thing, right? There we go. So now let me change this over to some other value. So it's not 10, it's not nine, it gives me a question mark. Once again, you can use it in your queries like this, where I go through and say, okay, examine the category. When it's category um, one, then A, two, then B, three, then C, it's pretty much the same as choose. In fact, um, that's why they made choose, because people were doing something like this on an ongoing basis, and they wanted to make it easy for them to do it. And once again, if I want to add on the uh, an else option, can do so just like this Let's figure out how to spell and there we go now it'll perform the same way as we saw before the reason why you might choose case over the choose function is just that it has more flexibility here's a, an example instead of examining one value I can evaluate many different values or many different questions. These questions are fundamentally different. Was it greater than, was it equal to, or less than? In fact, they can, the questions can vary quite wildly. Um, notice that it's any, any value with, available to me within the select or I, that I can make up. My example here is that I look at the required date and the ship date, and if it was actually... Uh, the ship date was less, then that means that it got there early, if it was equal, on time, and less um, if it was late. So now I go ahead and run this. And that is definitely a nice little report, something that's useful and easy to write. Uh, the immediate if couldn't do that because it only has two options. The choose couldn't do it because it has to examine a, a numeric value of 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. But with this option, I can uh, I have a lot more flexibility. So use case all the time, although not considered a function. It um, certainly acts similar to a function in that uh, the way it evaluates as an expression. Now back on to some other existing functions. We saw the is date uh, is numeric. Uh, is another one. This is used for validation. Is it true that this should be considered a, a number? Yes, one. How about this one? No, false, zero. How about this one? Yes, that's fine too, even though it's got a decimal point. Uh, is date, again, we saw, and it works as you probably would suspect, but uh, this one's approved, this one's approved, this one's approved. We saw that formatting earlier. Uh, this one's also approved, January 01, 2001, but 1st of January, not going to work. That's, uh, that's actually pretty handy, though, 
because that means that you can kind of test to see what is acceptable. People most of the time enter data in from things like a web page where they have text boxes that they type things in. If you use a calendar control of some type where they click on a little uh, calendar image and then they can choose the option, then you bypass a lot of the validation issues. But if you let people type in text into text boxes, and certainly that does happen, people have an option, then you need to use validation code to, to make sure that the format is acceptable. In SQL, this is a way to validate the date. Now, um, if I'm working with strings of characters, which is often the case, I can use a number of these. Uppercase and lowercase are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, right trim and left trim are not as self-explanatory, but pretty easy to figure out. Basically, I've got a bunch of spaces here, some on the left, some on the right. With left trim, it takes out the spaces on the left. With right trim, it takes out the spaces on the right. With trim left and trim uh, right trim uh, and left trim combined, I can finally get rid of all the spaces. Some languages have an actual trim function which would do it all, but SQL doesn't have that. So you have to do a combination. Substring allows me to find a particular character as a starting point and then grab a number of values. Now this says start at three and go over three characters. Problem is I don't have three characters. Let's start at three and go over one character and see what we get. We get an S. So two characters would be ST starting at three and going over two. But as we saw, if you have any number higher than that, it forgives you and gives you back your values. The starting number is one, two, three. So it starts off at one. Pattern index is often uh, used along with substring. You're looking for a particular pattern, so you don't have to know exactly what that number is. When you find an S, give me the number. You have to tell it what data you're trying to pull a, a value out of, but this tells me it starts off at three. And I could use this to figure out where the S was. Instead of actually putting a hard-coded value, as it's called, I just go through and I put the pattern index looking for the S, and it comes back. What happens is that this evaluates into three. Then after that, it uses the substrate function to start at three and go over up to five characters. A string is, a str is a convert function. It's very simple, and you could use convert or cast to do pretty much the same thing, but there are some differences. So if I go through and use str, it will lose my um, values here. Oddly enough, it kind of pads it out with a bunch of extra spaces too. If I go through and say, okay, I want up to five characters, and three are allowed after the decimal point, that's what I get here. Um, it's interesting if I say five characters and two, and it'll just go ahead and cut it off. Notice that it did do some rounding. So if I had five and three, if I go five and two, it rounded up to five. So if, what happens if I go three and five? Okay. Well, five, the, the five here should have been up to five numbers after it. And I, we had three, so that should have worked. The thing is, though, we only got two numbers. What's odd about it is it counts the dot. But I guess it's not really looking at it as a number. It's looking at a string of characters. So dot's a character, three characters with up to five after the decimal point. But since you only have, uh, you've already hit three characters by the time you get to uh, the one there, 3.1 then you, it stops. If I tried to do a conversion like this, it would work just fine. But oddly enough, if I go ahead and change the 15 here to three and try again, I get an error message. It says arithmetic overflow. That's because there's not enough space to actually present it as character data. You would think it would be forgiving. It's not. 
that's where this function comes in handy. Uh, another function that's handy for working with strings is the format. I guess um, working with strings actually should, should say creating a string and then formatting it um, appropriately. This is a, a newer function and has a little bit more fine tuning on things. So here we have uh, the get date function we saw before. I'm going to apply the format to it. And uh, once again, let me uh, bring that up. I don't know why it's making me do it twice, but it is. Okay. So here there's uh, various different formatting options. It's um, it's kind of interesting that the CD format, you have to click on certain links to get the, the full scoop and of some examples. But it does show you some examples that you can use. And like custom numeric format strings, if you don't like uh, what they have, you can always build your own format. Lots of choices. Here's some uh, simple ones. So let's say I go through and I take the date and I want it formatted as a date. I want it to be a US, uh, English US date or English Great Britain date. Notice that the, um, ha, turns out today happens to be um, a day where, let me change it over. Gonna change it here. Not easily. Okay, let me put in a different date. How about, so, 08. Now let me actually put in the universal format here. So 17.08.07. And it'll work. Well, then again, maybe not. Okay. It didn't accept it as a date. There we go. So, well, that is interesting too. Okay, I'm gonna have to adjust the date here. Let me see if I can do it easily. It's not easy like it used to be. Or as easy as it used to be. Okay, let's make it seven. There we go. That was a lot of work to, to show you this. Notice that, uh, of course, Great Britain shows a day, month, year. We have month, day, year, and it picked that up. Uh, and then, of course, the German version is um, 07, so day, month, year with uh, the dots. Let's see, next, um, formats. So this is currency, English, Great Britain, uh, Germany. You'll see that we have the dollar sign, the pound, and the euro. Um, one thing that's interesting, if you select the data with a dollar sign, it makes it easier for you to spot what I'm talking about, but it didn't present it that way. So you would think it would pick it up. It doesn't, if you show it as character data, of course, it will select that. But um, natively, as a number, even with a dollar sign, it doesn't seem to, um, it doesn't actually pick that up, which uh, you would expect it to. It doesn't. This is also true when you store the data in um, a database. So if you insert it with a dollar sign, a lot of times I do just to make it clear what I'm working with. When it actually gets stored, it doesn't get stored with the dollar sign. So people have to know what that is. Maybe changing the column names to indicate that is appropriate. And another thing to note is that none of these look at the current exchange rate. They're just a formatting option. So there's nothing going out the internet and looking at the, the current exchange rate. Let's see. The left function and right function are pretty straightforward. If I take a variable and I put some data into it, and then I ask to take the first four letters on the left, I get this. First four letters on the right, 
one, two, three, four. I get that. That's exactly what we see when we run the code. We just saw left trim and right trim. And we saw upper, lower. We didn't see stuff though. Stuff says, okay, start looking at one, go to three, and then replace those three letters with this. So expression, start, length, replace with. Replace is um, another function. I actually use this on a regular basis. It's uh, the expression, the pattern you're looking for, and then the string press replacement. Now in this case, I'm looking for Bob's. So I don't have to actually figure out the number. I just put in the pattern I'm looking for. And the pattern can be um, very flexible. So you can come over to the help file and you can see some different options here. Unfortunately, this language does not support regular expressions, so that's an issue. But um, it's still pretty handy. And one thing to note is that when you use this, it will search for every um, match in that string of characters. So because they have Bob here twice, it replaces it twice. There are three times, it replaces it three times. We saw pattern index. Uh, again, it's pretty handy for searching through the data. Uh, so if I go through and I say, okay, I want to see something that has a percentage sign here. It doesn't replace it. It's looking for a literal value. If I want something a little bit more flexible, um, I can go ahead and locate the item by looking at it using a wildcard support. So this is the pattern that it uses and that's that's different. So a pattern index, I'm looking for a particular pattern. It only gives me back integers though. So that's the downside. In some languages, in many languages, they have support for something called regular expressions, which is a fancy find and replace. And this language doesn't have support for that. It's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. So what you do is you use it in combination, like I did earlier, with substring and pattern index to do all kinds of things. Like in this case, I'm exploding an email. By looking for where the at symbol is, it begins. Or excuse me, it begins, I go ahead and start with the first part, taking the person's name, or using from the at symbol and going to the dot. I get the company name, and then after the dot, I get the domain name. And that's it. There's uh, a lot of built-in functions, um, but if none of them suit your needs, the next thing you can do is you can go through and create your own functions yourself. That is always an option. And that's the next thing I want to look at.